Good afternoon, everyone. I am Rahul Gosain. And I'm Rohit Gosain. And we are Oncology Brothers. Today, we're joined by Dr. Narcis Duma Flores, who's a world renowned thoracic medical oncologist at the Dana Farber Cancer Institute, where she's also leading the efforts in diversity, equity, and inclusion in medicine. In our discussion with Dr. Flores, we're hoping to focus on clinically relevant studies that were recently presented at the World Conference on Lung Cancer and how these studies should change our clinical practice. Let us welcome Dr. Narjest Flores. Thank you for having me. It's truly an honor to be with the Ankh brother. Well, we are very humbled. Thank you. Well, uh, let's dive into our first abstract, yes study. For our discussion today, Dr. Flores, we are starting with a study that focuses on importance of smoking cessation. Could you please walk us through this study and its findings? Yes. So the YES study is a drug chart enhanced stop smoking study. Um, this is a study that allocates smoking cessation at the same time. So this is important. The patients were coming to a lung cancer screening and they were connected with a smoking cessation specialist. They had two cohorts, one cohort that we get the regular follow-up in four weeks, and the other cohort that we get an enhanced follow-up with uh, subsequent interventions. The main intervention in this study was the patients were provided a booklet that included a picture of their lungs and a picture of their hearts showing the coronary calcifications and showing the emphysema changes in their lungs comparing and this came in conjunction with behavioral therapy and pharmaceutical interventions and it's important to mention that this study one of the interventions was eat cigarettes or vaping which is a little bit controversial but was part of this study and this is not the moment to talk about it but um, it shows that the patients were higher indices of quitting smoking and the quitting smoking was not only done by the patient saying, I quit smoking. They actually had a confirmation by carbon dioxide monitoring, which I found to be fascinating. Um, so they found that the smoking rates increased, but they also found which two things that I found very interesting. One, it was less than, and they found gender differences. And this supports the data before that smoking interventions should be tailored to genders because the nicotine dependency is psychologic and physiologic based on gender. So women were less likely to quit with this intervention compared to men when they would compare it at the cutoff time. It wasn't as effective. But what I really like is that we finally had a smoking sensation presentation in the presidential symposium. We forget about the importance of smoking sensation even if patients have already lung cancer, they do better. But in the U.S., only 3 to 6% of patients with cancer, all cancers, receive a smoking sensation counseling. Dr. Flores, um, what do you do in your clinical practice uh, to implement smoking cessation in education? The uptake in lung screening is actually still very low. So how should we tackle those two things in the community? So the first thing I have to acknowledge my privilege. I'm the director of smoking sensation at Dana Farmer. So, uh, so we have a trained, we have a trained social worker in our group that she's trained in a smoking sensation and she's a bilingual smoking sensation expert. Um, and we have a consortium with NGH where we have a database and the patients get into the program, it's a 16, 12 to 16 week program, and it's all virtual for our patients. Oh, perfect. And she's able to, you know, through EPIC, prescribe the pharmacotherapy that if it's needed, the behavioral therapy, because she's a master's in social work, you know, they get trained. So that's a privilege I have to mention. A smoking sensation, and we know that only providing the number or the quick line is not enough. Um, so put it in your template, refer the patient to the adequate program and lung cancer screening. We're only screening 6% of the population. And if you think about it, women of color are the group that is less. So I think continue to talk about the importance and breaking down the data 
for our colleagues in primary care is important because there's a myth about high false positive. No, those the data was, I guess, the news pick it out. It was deeper in a wrong way. So the rates of false positive are not as high as we all thought they were. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. We can now jump on our second study, the Shaw study, which was led by you and your group in Boston. Can you please share the findings and the clinical importance of this study, not just for lung cancer, but for all our oncology patients? Yes, so sexual health, particularly for women, has been surrounded by taboo and is often not discussed. As a fun fact to you uh, and to your listeners, the female clitoris was not fully dissected until the early 2000s. But we decode, decode the human genome before we fully dissected the clitoris. So you can see the discrepancy there and the lack of knowledge we have about female sexuality. In the 1800s and before, female sexuality could not be studied uh, because it was. So the show study is the largest study today evaluating sexual health in women with lung cancer. It recruited 249 participants. The age ranged from their 20s to their 80s. The majority of patients have a stage four disease and around 45% of them had target therapy. The results were sobering. We found that 77% of the study participants had moderate to severe sexual dysfunction. And you're wondering what this moderate to severe means. It means it's affecting their daily life and their quality of life. And what also we learned from the show study is that their needs are very different than other patients. We often extrapolate data from breast cancer about sexual health to patients with lung cancer, very different physiology. One of the number one reasons women were reporting sexual dysfunction was shortness of breath. And when you look at the data in breast cancer, that's in the bottom of the list, right? These patients have long radiation, long surgery, and another reasons included depression, included depression of feeling unhappy, uh, fatigue, which is an often underestimated side effect. And we asked patients before and after lung cancer, what were some of these physical symptoms they noted most? Vaginal dryness and vaginal pain or discomfort with penetration or self-stimulation. And I wanna put things in perspective. Self-stimulation is extremely important to women's behaviors, health. We, I don't have to name all the benefits of sex for our health. They have been reported a million times, but simple solutions to a big problem, like we just did in the past, vaginal lubricants. So there are very small solutions that can go a long way. And before you ask me, it's like, we're not trained about this, right? We cannot train it. We spend days talking about how the microtubules get inhibited by plaquitaxel, and all of that, right? But there's easy, addressing it is easy as, let's talk about your sexual health. The patient may not wanna talk at it, about it the first time, but when they come back the next day on clinic, they're gonna say, oh, Dr. Flores, why you asked me, I have been thinking about it. So you only have to say, let's talk about your sexual health. And you can refer based on the needs. Yeah, no, you're absolutely correct that as physicians, we need to do better in bringing this up and discussing it with all our patients. Yes. It's time to bring sexual health to thoracic oncology care. Absolutely. Now, uh, let us have a look about heavily debated Empower study and its update. This is a study in adjuvant non small cell lung cancer population. Dr. Flores, can you? walk us through the inclusion criteria for the study and how are you utilizing atezolizumab in your practice? Okay, so the iEmpower data that was presented at our work conference is an interim analysis of overall survival data. One thing that we all need to remember is that this stage is based on the seven staging system and lung cancer staging change. So these are 1B to 3A and e copper from a cell, so 0 to 1, that got a lot back to me on surgery, and they had to have PDL1 analysis. They didn't have a cutoff for the study. Patients were mandatory to receive chemo. This is very different to the keynote study with Pembro in the adjuvant setting. 
and empowered chemotherapy, which has a very well-known overall survival benefit, limited, but as well-known, was mandatory. Then the patients were randomized to a atezolizumab for a year. Where, so the approval in the United States is for a pdl one higher than 1% and for tumors higher than 4 centimeters or stage 2 and 3A. So what the overall survival data shows? Let's start with the easy one. Atezolizumab in the adjuvant setting should not be used in patients with EGFR and non mutation. There was no overall survival benefit in those patients and should not be used in patients with a PD-1 less than 1%. There was no overall survival data. So the, the question, what, what, who patients should get it? Well, what is very clear is patients with a PD-1 higher than 50%, but then the 1 to 49%, and these bring memories to Kino 042. Um, that is a trend. It is a trend and still immature data. Is the trend going to mature? I know the person to say uh, that. I think the data is still very positive that there is benefit, particularly for the stage three patients, because the chance of recurrence is around 75%. So I think it should be individualized, but the study for the study for I'm Power 110 is still pending. We don't know this, the the final read, but if the patient has a PD-1 higher than 50%, they should go in a TSO adjuvantly. 1 to 49%, let's have good discussions with patients, risks and benefits in full pathology reports. What's the plus pleural involvement? What lymph nodes were involved? What is the patient's performance styles? What is the patient histologic type? Oh, does the patient have any other mutations? So, as I always say, this brings attention to the importance of biomarker testing. Thank you for that. Talking about recent approval, just like a TISO, let's have a look at our last study, Nadim 2 trial, which looks at neoadjuvant chemo IO, which is also approved in non small cell lung cancer. Can you please walk us through this study, please? So the difference between Nadine 2 and Checkmate A16 is that Nadine focused on patients with stage 3A and B. This time, <laughs> these patients require histologic confirmation of N2, another N2 involvement in order to be enrolled. That's important. These patients needed that. So they were randomized to carboplaquetaxel plus nevo or just chemotherapy. But let's start with the Complete pathology response was higher in the experimental arm compared to the control arm. Um, and this is no surprise because we have done neoadjuvant chemo before and didn't play out for lung cancer. The addition of the immunotherapy is what makes a difference here. But we have improved overall survival data here of one group versus the other. Another thing that's important to mention is that neoadjuvant chemo immunotherapy in this group did not delay surgery. And that was a worry that we had. There was no significant. So Nadine 2, I don't think has changed practice because we already have incorporated neoadjuvant data. We already know. But it's a little fine because now we have overall survival data. And for Checkmate A16, we only have disease-free survival. And Checkmate A16 is still maturing. But Nadine shows that stage 3 patients, the thing that with the adjuvant setting, do need more than just the standard of care. The, but to the listeners, I think it's important that we remember that the standard of care for stage 3B, you know, still are there uh, for the old 3B, and that we shouldn't give patients neoadjuvant therapy with the hope of downgrading their stage, because that will only hurt them long term. Because the Pacific data, we have five years of Pacific data in which 40% of those patients are cured. So, like my grandma would say, don't get excited with the new saint. Doesn't mean the old saint doesn't do, do, do doesn't do miracles. Absolutely. So the Pacific data is still there. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Flores. That's very valuable information for all community oncologists. We hope that our community oncologists will get a chance to incorporate all this data into their new data practices as well. Thank you so much again.